Hello and welcome everybody. So in this section we are going to consider just a single of the beta i, so single regression coefficient, and we are considering how well can be estimated using the least squares estimator we have studied. So we have beta hat i is our estimate for beta i and we have beta i and we want to know how close are the two to each other. And we'll use different techniques, we'll later consider confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. But here I want to first start by just thinking how should we actually measure the distance between these two. So let's take a look at the formulas and see what's the best way of measuring this distance. So far we have seen some general criteria, we have seen the estimator here is unbiased, so we know that on average equal this, if we do many cases or many instances of the randomness, and we have studied the covariance of this, so in theory we know all there is to know, but still that was not a very usable form, so we need to work a bit on that. And the first question I want to ask is how should we measure the difference between the two, so the estimation error. And the naive way would be to do what I just wrote, beta hat i minus beta i. But this is not so useful in practical terms because we know what that is. We have seen beta hat i is normal distributed with mean beta i and variance sigma squared x transpose x inverse. So after I subtract beta i, we know that's normal distributed with mean zero and the same variance sigma squared x transpose x inverse. But the problem with this is we don't know sigma squared. So this sigma squared here is unknown. And we know also what to do there. So we know sigma hat squared is 1 over n minus p minus 1 sum i from 1 to n y i minus y hat i squared is an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. So we could attempt to somehow make use of this and that's exactly what we are going to do. Let me write an intermediate step up here. If I divide the left hand side by sigma, then this zero is divided by sigma, nothing happened. And that expression here, the covariance matrix will be divided by sigma squared because it's a variance type thing. So now I have the sigma here and now we could try to replace that with sigma hat. So let's say sigma hat is square root of sigma hat squared. Then we could consider beta hat i minus beta i divided by sigma hat, the estimated standard deviation, and that we know better. I just noticed I made a mistake here. I will just quickle this in. So what we need here is, of course, because we are looking at a single component, we need row i, column i of this inverse matrix. So once we have fixed this now, that we can understand. That's input data in x, so we know x. x transpose x inverse we can compute. So that's much better once we've gotten rid of the unknown sigma by replacing it with sigma hat. Now the next thing I want to improve is this here we don't know the distribution of because replacing sigma with sigma hat will change the distribution. There will be more variance because we have extra variance from the denominator here. So we don't know what the distribution of that quantity is. And we need to work a bit, but it turns out actually very nearly we can find out what that is. So what I want to do is I want to use the shorthand CII for this, the logic being that C is my name for X transpose X inverse. And it turns out that if we write the CII here with the square root, that then originally that thing would have been standard normal distributed. And that's no longer true, but it turns out we can actually find the distribution of this. And I will show you that will be t distributed with n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom. So that's the main result of the first part of this section. So let me show that. So the quantity I'm talking about is, again, beta hat i minus beta i divided by c i i and then sigma hat squared. If I pull it inside the square root and then we take the square root of the thing. And I want to show that is t distributed and just to remind you, t distribution, so let t equal say z over square root of y over nu, 
Then if z is standard normal distributed, y is chi-squared distributed with new degrees of freedom, and z and y are independent, then t is t distributed also with new degrees of freedom. That's the definition of the t distribution. It's the ratio of a normal distribution and the square root of a chi-square distribution, and then you need to scale it by dividing by the degrees of freedom. Good. Let's see whether we can write t in this form, and turns out we can. Namely, beta hat i minus beta i we know is normal distributed, only the variance is wrong, we want it standard normal distributed, so what we need to do is we need to divide it by the standard deviation, and that is square root of sigma squared cii. And then to make it right, we need to do the same thing in the denominator, so here we did have cii sigma hat squared, and now to keep the two terms equal, we need to also down divide by the square root of sigma squared cii. And there is a bit subtle point. The sigma squared, I said earlier, was causing problems because we don't know it. And now I introduced it, so that could be trouble, but it turns out it's not, because we can always cancel it and go back to that expression, which has now sigma squared in explicitly. So that's only for my argument that t is t distributed, but that's not used for actually getting numerical values for t, so we still retain the property, we can get the value of t without using unknown quantities. Okay, so we have numerator is now standard normal distributed, and it turns out with the denominator we are also good, namely, copy that once more, beta hat i minus beta i divided by square root sigma squared cii. The only thing we need to do here is we need to bring it into this form, and here we need at the end to divide by n minus p minus 1, that's going to be our degrees of freedom, and to make that right we pre-multiply with n minus p minus 1, these two will cancel in a minute, and then I copy the other terms cii sigma hat squared. Good, so that would do the job. If we can show the distributions are right, so z is beta hat i minus beta i divided by square root sigma squared cii, and we saw that here, the sigma is already over, that is the right thing to divide by, so before it was normally distributed with the wrong variance, we have divided by the standard deviation, so that's standard normal distributed. And then y, if it's going to work, well first I forgot the square root here, don't know where that happened, here it's still there. So y, if that's going to work, will be n minus p minus 1 cii sigma hat squared. Ah, and I just spot another mistake, I fix this in red, this sigma squared I had forgotten to copy over, so we need to also divide by sigma squared here. So we get it divided by sigma squared here, and then divided by sigma squared here, and that quantity you can find in equation 4.6, chapter 4 of the notes. This equation we showed there is chi-squared distributed with n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom. So that looks very promising. Now the last thing we need to do is we need to check that condition, the two z and y need to be independent, and this is the task for Cochran theorem, one of the statements there was the quantities h epsilon and identity minus h epsilon are independent. And there is then a basic result from probability, if two random variables, these are both random variables, if they are independent then also any functions of them are also independent. So I can squeeze in any function f here and any function g, and these functions, if they are deterministic, they cannot introduce a dependence between the two. So that gives us a chance, and it turns out, I show this in the notes, I'm not going through this here, that one can really make it so that if you choose f cleverly, then that one here turns into what I call z, and this one here turns into what I call y. So using Cochran theorem, and rewriting z as a function of h epsilon and y as a function of i minus h epsilon, one can show the two are indeed independent. So 
that in the note. You should check it there, but that also works out. And then we can conclude t is t distributed with n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom. Good. And this is excellent news. Namely, now we have something which still looks like it measures the error between the two quantities. It's the difference beta hat i minus beta i, just by straight subtraction. And then it's scaled by some constant of proportionality. Well, it's nearly constant of proportionality. It's just here's the sigma at square, which also has the data. So that looks like a very reasonable measure for the distance. For example, if beta at i is exactly equal to the truth, that thing is zero. If beta at i is too big, t will be positive and so on. And this measure, which looks reasonable, we have now understood the distribution of. So we know if the model is true, what it's meant to do. And we will be able to know, for example, the t distribution has densities, which look a bit like normal densities in the middle. It has heavier tails. So here we will be able to find cutoffs where we say values down here are very improbable, which will help us with tests, or if we look at the middle bit, will help us with confidence intervals. So that's worth a lot and will help us with all kinds of things. And the other property is this distance we can compute from data because it has the estimated variance here. Good. So that's a success.